Hello, I'm Stuart Preston, and this is the Stone Ape Reports, where I have conversations with those who have changed their lives with the help of psychedelics. In this episode, I had the honor of speaking with Kim. Now, I was excited to have Kim on because she's a real force in the psychedelic community, including her latest venture, Lit Mind, an organization created to support people working with psychedelics. She talked about addiction, grief, and the unique psilocybin regimen. So please enjoy this conversation with Kim. All right, Kim, well, thank you so much uh, for joining me here on the Stone Day Reports. You have provided a lot of great information and several guests for the podcast. And at one point, I just thought, why, why don't I ask Kim to be on the podcast? And so, you know, maybe I was a little shy because you, you know so many people and you've done so much. And I was just like, well, I don't know if she would do this. So I'm really grateful that you agreed to, to come here and share your story. So thank you for, uh, for doing this. Oh, thank you. That's very sweet. Yeah, I, I just got lucky in time and place of meeting some cool people. And I'm really glad that you got a chance to speak with some of them about. Yeah. 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 And they, they were fantastic. Really, really good people. So, um, well, why don't, why don't we dive in here and see, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, your story, you know, what was going on in your life? I know that with me, you'd, you'd mentioned, um, you know, addiction, grief, grief was obviously very close to my, my own heart there, but, uh, you had some things going on in life and eventually came to psychedelics, you know, to maybe get some help to help you help yourself. But, you know, what, what is that story? What is Kim's story? Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I grew up in LA, um, and lived in the Bay area for a long time. So there's a lot of access that, you know, a lot of people probably don't have. Hmm. Um, but, uh, growing up in LA, I dabbled, I did some LSD and some mushrooms when I was a teenager, but nothing profound, nothing. I really had any, I didn't have the context and I just, I didn't have the awareness of how to even digest stuff back then. Mm. Um, and then um, I went to Sonoma State University up up north and I did a degree in psychology and I kind of didn't really know what I was getting into, but I, um, all my, uh, uh, I would say 90% of my professors were involved in the psychedelic movement um, in the 60s. And they were an extension of um, the San Francisco University. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sonoma State was like their, their psych arm. Um, And then it became its own university. But those professors, my neuropsychology teacher was um, in what was called the Extronaut program, which was doing high dose LSD um, with a male and female therapist um, with them. And there was uh, talk of MDMA and talk of other psychedelics and rites of passage and all these things I got exposed to not even have any concept that that was a thing that was out there. And, um, and I did my psych degree and I loved it. It's technically a humanistic, transpersonal, existential psycho psychology degree. And yeah, I know. I thought that's what psychology was. I was wrong. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I tried to go out into the world of psychology, like bright eyed, bushy tailed and discovered it was all behavioral based. Mm. And I did that for a few years, um, doing behavioral, um, uh, therapy therapies with uh, teenagers and pretty much all I was doing was babysitting a bunch of kids on um, pharma. They were all on pharmaceuticals of some sort and yeah. broke my heart. And I had to, and I just was like, this is not something I want to do. So I went back to school for, for uh, business and, and ended up uh, going kind of towards wellness and health. Hmm. And um, uh, my mom passed away. My mom passed away when I was 29. Hmm. I was, I was like blissfully unaware of death in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. When I was a kid, we, we didn't go to anybody's funerals. Um, it was just kind of like grandma and grandpa aren't here anymore. Hmm. And, and it wasn't really clear. And, and it became a little bit more clear because a couple of my uncles passed away pretty young and it was from addiction. Um, Mm. And so it was, there was a lot of shame around their death because they died of something that's perceived disease. And they, my my parents, I don't think wanted to face it and talk about it. So um, my mom's death came really came down hard for me because she was sick. And then three months later, she was dead. Wow. That is rough. Yeah. I didn't really know how to process that. And so I had, 
I had drank wine quite a bit, um, but I didn't really get to a place where it was a thing that numbed me until I mm-hmm. had blood. And, um, and I, I, I drank for 10 years. Um, and so I'm only a year sober. Um, wow, it, well, good, good for you. Thank you. It took, it took a, a lot um, of, there, it wasn't a constant. It was a, I wouldn't drink for a couple months and then I'd go back to it. I would, I would drink a lot and then I wouldn't drink. And, and mm. it, was, it was this weird because there was so much shame because of my family. They're like, don't drink. But that's because that's what took everybody down. But yeah, there. And it's, 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 um, I'm not going to say, I, I don't know if I agree entirely with the, it's in your genetics and you're predestined, but I do know that there is a lot of secrecy in my family and a lot of stuff that, um, that just sort of leads to shame, which is kind of the underlier. It feels like trauma and shame is what kind of what everybody who has an addiction seems to have in common that I've just kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, let's see, seven years ago, um, I stumbled across a sweat lodge ceremony that um, someone was hosting uh, and she also offered private ayahuasca ceremonies and I had been hearing about it. I, uh, ran a wellness center for a number of years and there was, when it was legal, when DMT was legal, they used to have parties there. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I was like, DMT, what is this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it kind of piqued my interest, but I, I didn't, I, I didn't pursue it. Yeah. And then opportunity to drink ayahuasca came um up for me and i i and and the thing with ayahuasca you cannot drink alcohol (laughs) beforehand you have to clean up your act you have to clean up your act in a lot of ways um but you can't mix it with pharmaceuticals and and alcohol what Um, happens and so i had to um not uh well there's a lot of things but it will make you very 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 sick during the mm. experience um and uh pretty much anything fermented because i, I believe it has uh and I, I might say this wrong theanine the mm-hmm. um it's a amino acid that's produced that it just it's contraindicated with meois which is what the ayahuasca vine is, is an okay MAOI, basically. and so it can from the, the lowest part point it could give you a really nasty headache to just vomiting uncontrollably and you just really don't get an experience you're just sick yeah Um, and in pharmaceuticals that's a whole other story that can um cause uh a lot of complications but that wasn't my problem um but uh so i had this experience with ayahuasca that just blew me out of the water um i was um incredibly deeply connected to something I didn't understand. Um, and I, I, I feel like I hung out with God mm-hmm. <laughs> and felt so deeply connected. I just automatically didn't drink for three, four months after that. Didn't have a desire. I wanted to stay present and really like experience the world. Right. Um, but it also ungrounded me quite a bit. And I think um, some people go into... Um, you know, go down to Peru or wherever they go and have these experiences thinking that's it. That's what's going to solve everything. Right. But there, that's not really true. <laughs> yeah. Um, I went into it wanting to know where my mom went because I understood people describing ayahuasca as the vine of the dead. Yeah. And I was like, oh, well, this will give me some insight. Um, I don't think I had any concept of where my mom went, but I felt deeply connected and I was I was at peace with the idea of death mm. afterward. And um, I've been working with ayahuasca since. Um, that's my primary um, therapeutic. Um, and I have a great deal of respect for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, it's not something anyone, c- I think, can go into half-heartedly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or she'll hand you your ass. <laughs> yeah. I think people know that experience. Um, I've worked with the uh, mushrooms therapeutically and recreationally since um, I've uh, used ketamine recreationally and therapeutically. I've sat in on therapeutic sessions with uh, high dose ketamine. Um, I not personally receiving it, but witnessing someone else and mm-hmm. uh, support. Um, what was a, uh, what was a therapeutic 
mushroom experience like? Um, so same person I sat with, with the ayahuasca, I also sat with, um, with the mushroom. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was, you know, I don't remember how many grams it was, probably three or four grams, not ridiculous, but you Mm -hmm. know, good good dose. Yeah. Uh, we went out into nature and we found a nice tree and laid down underneath it. And I, I remember distinctly there, the, there wasn't a particular thing I was after. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just wanting to heal more because I was still drinking. I was still going back and forth. This was a few years after the initial ayahuasca experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember distinctly laying down and closing my eyes and feeling like this huge thick plate of glass was over me. And this, uh, fairy looking thing came and knocked on the glass and was like, why aren't you out here with us? Mm. And, and I was like, Oh, and it, it, it kept, it was like all these messages that it just, it's, it's not that psychedelics give you some magical solution. They just keep letting you know that there is more and that you don't have to be numb. That's my experience of, of how it's been therapeutic for um, addiction. They kind of show you stuff. They show you, they show you that there's a better experience than what you're experiencing. And also, and some of the harder experiences, uh, particularly with ayahuasca, um, really showed me why we needed to be numb. There was some traumas that I didn't know I had, uh, Hmm. some, some stuff it was really distinctly clear in the womb. I was, I was experiencing, this is kind of a trip, but I was in the womb. I was experiencing something and I was put stress when she was pregnant with me. Um, my uh, father's uh, best friend killed himself with oh. an overdose during my mom's pregnancy with me. And oh. so my, my, mother's experience was this really intensely stressful time. And so I was being fed all these stress hormones. This is my interpretation, of course, but it was Aya saying, look, you got set up with a lot of stress, kid. Like just, this is, this was your lot. It's Mm -hmm. okay. Let's work with it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Did you, did you go into that mushroom, the therapeutic mushroom experience with, with an intention was, was part of the therapy to set an intention or like you kind of yes. alluded to, was it something you were like, hey, let's just continue what was already started? It was, why do I still need to be numb? Why is it that I'm still needing mm-hmm. this? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and honestly, I think um, that, that experience gave me some insight. Um, I didn't, for my, uh, it, it, I guess because I got so thrown way out there with ayahuasca, the, the first real therapeutic experience I had, the mushroom dose wasn't high enough for, in my mind, I was like, mm-hmm. no, I need to go bigger, further, more, yeah. uh, which, by the way, is not the case. Um, <laughs> right. for those that are like, yeah, I have to do a 10 gram journey. No, you don't. No, you don't. Um, <laughs> yeah. Some of my best um, journeys have been one and a half grams. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, there was a period in my life where I had access to a good amount of mushrooms mm-hmm. and I decided and I had, um, I had been laid off from a, a job. And so I had unemployment and I had some time. And so, and I was like, you know what? I need to reflect on what I want to do next. Um, and I did a month where every weekend I did a one or two grams, usually, usually two of mushrooms. And then during the week I did three to four days of microdosing. <laughs> and, um, and it was a month of that. And I feel like, I was able to uh, come to terms with a a couple things. And, um, and that's actually when I redirected myself and was like, what am I doing? What, what do I want to be doing? And I thought, I really want to be helping people get what they're really good at out there. And I've been doing that in many different forms, but not in the form of marketing. And I always thought that marketing was evil. (laughs) <laughs> because oh uh, yeah <laughs> because of my psychological background like yeah. I it was mind washing your brain brainwashing excuse me um and uh and then I realized no actually 
there's, 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 there's good to be done. And I can help people who have some really amazing things that they're doing, get them out to the world. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was like, yep, that's what I'm doing. (laughs) Yeah. Outstanding. So what, um, do you have more, do you have more uh, experiences that you want to share and, or, um, and if not, tell us a bit about kind of how life is different or better now as a result of these journeys? Yeah, um, I, I definitely, um, one, one thing that I, I'd love to share, just because I think a lot of people approach psychedelics, uh, mo- mostly because it's, it's gotten the best press, is mushrooms is the place to start. Um, it, that's, it can, it, it's very lovely, but for, um, I would say somebody who may tend toward um, not, not being a terribly grounded human, um, mm-hmm. if that's something you know about. Um, I, I have found that mescaline in the form of San Pedro, um, also peyote. We talked a little bit about that before we started, yeah. um, is so much sweeter and more grounding and is more gentle in a way that I think to me, I, I like to, when people say, well, I want to, I want to experiment with psychedelics. Okay. Start with some of the cactuses because hmm. they're, they're more gentle. Um, and, and that's my opinion, but, um, there's, there's a lot that, um, that mushrooms can throw at you depending on the strain and the strength and how much you take and people just don't know. And sometimes I remember, um, at one point, um, I helped the psychedelic society of San Francisco kind of get up and running again after it being, Mm -hmm. um, and we were at a conference, uh, and this woman walked up to the table and was like psychedelics. Yeah, I did mushrooms 10 years ago and I've, I've been in therapy ever since. And I was like, oh, gosh. And yeah. it, it just pulled her so far off center. And I'm not saying that's going to happen to everybody. But first and foremost, psychedelics is not, they're not a cure-all. And secondarily, they're not for everybody. <laughs> and go see Yeah, that. they're, they're <laughs> not. Because I get the they're same not. thing. Because I'll be at a, in fact, I got accosted by a bunch of other gray-headed, gray-headed people. <laughs> at a uh, conference and I don't remember what I had done or said, but they all thought that I had the answers and they're all gathered around me and go, so what do we do? Where do we start? And I just was like, well, first of all, this may not even be for you. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, I'm never going to recommend that to somebody, but uh, coincidentally I gave them the same advice. I was like, start with peyote. We've got the peyote way church here in Arizona. You can go do it legally. It's very nice, gentle. The setting is even if you didn't even drink the peyote and you sat out there for an entire day and night, it would be an experience that'll be unlike anything else you ever had. So try go do that first. Yeah. Yeah. So I like I like that advice because you're right, with some people diving into the teachers, the mushrooms can really be they can throw them off and into therapy for a few years. Yeah. Yeah. And my most profound experience of being able to speak, which was my intended goal, speak with the dead, was through mm-hmm. peyote. I I oh, very wow. Clearly, I was fighting off the medicine, which which folks may have that experience in various forms. But I fought off the peyote for about six hours and was like just kind of in a dream state, but was like, nope, 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 nope. And then finally it came <laughs> around and I, I had this really clear, distinct um, experience of speaking with my grandfather, my, my mother's father and my mother. Wow. And. Um, I did, th- I did so through automatic writing, which was just, they, like, I was just told, go get a pen and paper and start writing. And I got to ex- like, write down everything they said and got a chance to ask them questions. And maybe I was just speaking to my higher self. May you, you, it doesn't, the, I'm not going to put it into some context of, I spoke with the dead, but I cl- clarified some stuff in, in my, my mind space by being able to have that experience and it came through peyote. And so I'm really grateful for peyote because yeah. it's, it's kind, it's directive, it's logical in a lot of ways. Whereas um, ayahuasca and, and, and mushrooms can be illogical and emotional and give you years of what the heck was that supposed to mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I've, I've found uh I found kind of the opposite. My, my cactus experiences have been very, very subtle, but I feel like they're, they're, they're giving me my lessons and some kind of poetry that I have to interpret over a long time. 
Like, what was I learning where I feel like mushrooms literally punched me in the face and say, this is the lesson. Oh, right. I'm giving this to you right now. Go make your life better. And ayahuasca for probably my first X number of experiences, I got nothing but amazing visuals. Really? And then, yeah. And I was always disappointed. I would go to the facilitator and say, well, this sucks. I'm not getting anything. <laughs> and I remember she was like, you know, it took me eight times before I got a message. And uh, I was like, okay. She yeah. said, you just have to go into it. It's all about mindset. And it's not as easy. And I finally got great advice on the mindset. And then I did have an amazing experience. But it was also very plain and easy to find, unlike the cactus, which seemed to be more uh, intellectual or something. Mm, interesting. So it was interesting. Wow. Yeah. And I think that that leads very perfectly into what happens now. Like what did it do in my life? Yeah. Um, It, um, it, it speaks to how very different our biochemistries are and our, our neurochemistries are. And that has fascinated me because, um, why on earth did I decide alcohol was the thing that I needed at that time frame in my, in my life? Like, why did I reach that? And, and why do people reach for certain things? Um, and I think it's, it's some of the things I'm uncovering um, through research and also speaking with people and also working with people, I'm recognizing how incredibly different we all are um, and how these medicines affect people so differently. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and that, that, I mean, I, I was very lucky because I did, uh, I started doing yoga when I was 15. So I had a lot of meditation under my belt and I did a, um, a, a licensure in biofeedback when I was in college. So I did a lot of really focused meditation work. And um, I think that prepped me to be able to navigate some of the weird wacky places of wow. psychedelics. Yeah. And, and I don't know, day-to-day person. I'm also a Californian. So mm-hmm. yep. <laughs> we're a little <laughs> um but i've gone into especially after my experience with working in, as a behavioral therapist witnessing all these kids and all these pharmaceuticals i really think um something that that needs to be addressed and um i think people are kind of trying to jump over is that we've been prescribed a lot of things um as as a as a country as a as a planet um, and people have become dependent, whether they call them addictions or not. Um, a number of people that I've met have, they started their addictions from a prescription. And obviously that wasn't my experience, but, um, that a- approaching, how do you reconcile what's going on that, that made you reach for a appointment for your doctor? <laughs> to go get a, a, um, a, a pharmaceutical. Yeah. Um, and what, what's underlying that? I think it, I think people are going, I'm going to go do psychedelics because it's going to just blow my mind and tell me everything I need to know. Yeah, it might. Um, but, but why are you going towards it? Um, and that's kind of, that's kind of the direction I've been going is in that investigation and, and, also just happenstance got a chance to meet with the folks that you've had on your podcast before um, from Inscape um, Recovery. They are an aftercare program uh, for Ibogaine and the doctor there, mm-hmm. um, um, Dr. Carlos has created a, a supplement line that helps to address the underlying issues of why you reach for a substance. And it's only available in Mexico and it's really hard to get here. Mm -hmm. And it's not that it's magical. It's just that it's, it's, it's helping your neurochemistry balance. And, um, I've, I've been taking it now for quite some time. Um, and it's, it's been incredibly useful for me. It's amino acids and herbs. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, I think, um, a a thing that, that was really, uh, amazing to me, um, and, and, and really sad as well, but, um, I'm part of the psychedelic society here in Nashville now that I moved to Nashville, by the way, I'm, I'm talking from Nashville. I don't know if I ever mentioned that, that I mentioned, I moved here recently. Um, but, um, I, uh, was, was just on the, the chat the other day on the Facebook chat. And one of the girls who had a friend here did an ayahuasca ceremony. She was talking about her friend and she went 
way off reservation. She's now lo- like looking like she had a psych- psychotic break after the ayahuasca experience. Oh. And I think that, um, and that, that was something that when in speaking to Dr. Carlos originally, um, he will ensure that everyone is pretty balanced before they go into any medicine work. Um, because people don't realize that that is a danger of ayahuasca. There is, there's things, um, that, um, that pharmacologically you don't want to mix, but also if you are predisposed to, um, the tendency in, in the, um, neuro, uh, neurotransmitter world, if you're high in what's called acetylcholine, um, oftentimes people who are high in that are, diagnosed as bipolar or they have a diagnosis of um of maybe having a, a distance from um reality at times and mm. people who are already predisposed to that if they go into ayahuasca it it elevates that quite a bit it elevates serotonin as well but it can it can cause a break and um there's a really great documentary um shane moss um it's called psychonautics i yeah. think have you seen that? I have not, it's, but for very specific reasons. Uh, okay. It's uh, really interesting to me because he is a psychonaut and it's, he's, he's funny and, you know, he makes things lighthearted, but the end of the, the documentary, he did a series of every psychedelic unknown man, which is not recommended, right. <laughs> obviously, um, but he ended with ayahuasca and he had a diagnosis of bipolar prior and mm. he was hospitalized for six weeks. And wow. it's something that I don't think anybody talks about. Actually, very few people talk about. And it's not, I'm not trying to say, don't do it as a result. I'm trying to say, know what you're getting into, understand yourself first mm-hmm. and understand like what you're coming into it with. Right. Um, I, I just, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to paint it in any horrible light, but I think just like anything, the, uh, there's dangers and it's not for everybody. <laughs> yes. And that's a key. That's a key. Cause you hear, if you spend your time on Reddit and on Facebook, you, you get to this point where it might look like a magic pill, just eat a few mushrooms yeah. or drink a little bit of tea. And then life is just all fixed and better. And it's important to understand that, yeah, there, there are dangers and you've got to approach it the right way. And like you said, I love the way you said it because it sounds very a lot like Sun Tzu is, you know, know yourself and, and know what you're getting into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I spent a lot of time processing that stuff and then working with, with Inkscape and realizing that um, looking at the landscape of what's happening right now in psychedelics, there's a large amount of money being poured into the creation of um, uh, unique psychedelic compounds because that's what you can patent. And mm-hmm. um, pharma has gotten into it. And, I, and I'm not going to say that's a bad thing because I think it's going to give access to a lot more people mm-hmm. um, aside from what it has currently given ac- what we well, who already has access but um but it means that a lot of people are going to be thrown into a new world without support um and so i saw that and um in reflecting of my own experience with with addiction and knowing that um the work actually was having a medicine experience and then 6 months of 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 really processing it is where it came from, where the healing came from. Mm-hmm. Um, I started talking to a, a bunch of people who have been doing a lot of this integration work underground, um, sort of their own personal process of going through an addiction and then integrating it and then understanding that process. And I wanted to connect people to those people. So I created something called um, lit mind, L Y T mind.com that allows people to connect to people who've already gone through the addiction process mm-hmm. um, and and mental health challenges and utilized psychedelics and then come out the other side and have been able to to really integrate their life differently yeah um, and move away from substances that don't serve them um, and part of that is um, getting um, the next the the medicines from um, 
or the supplements rather from uh, uh, Dr. Carlos up from Mexico into the US um, to be able to, to rebalance some of the stuff with just supplementing yourself to prepare yourself. If, if you want to go towards psychedelics, great. If you don't, great. Yeah. See if you can feed your mind and, and let yourself get balanced. Cause I, I know after abusing alcohol for as long as I did, um, my dopamine levels were shot to hell mm -hmm. and I, I still, I've, I've supplemented them for a year and a half and I don't know if I'll be able to not supplement. I don't know. We'll find yeah. out. Yeah. You don't, you don't know. Yeah. But I do notice when I'm, if I run out very much. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it has a lot to do with food. It has a lot to do with what you do every day. If you sit in silence, if you're able to sit in silence with yourself, then you can look at psychedelics. If you can't sit down quietly with your own mind, you're about ready to get way too much information. If you think psychedelics <laughs> are going to be your cure all. <laughs> that is interesting. So if you can, and, and you don't necessarily even mean a meditation program or meditating. You just mean if you can, if you can sit down and quiet the monkey mind, quiet the flow of all these thoughts for a little bit, then you, then you may be ready. But if you can't, then you're in for a flood of information from the, the psychedelics opening up the gates. That's my experience and a, and, a, and a number of other people, especially those that have done integration work. Um, you know, they do it professionally or, or have received integration work. Um, a lot of it is before and after um, making sure that you have space in your mind. That was that the going back to the, the, um, the neuro uh, psychology teacher I had in, in college, he worked with a, a male and female therapist for six months before doing that LSD high dose LSD trip. They knew that then they understood it. Yeah. And they knew make sure you have the space the emotional, the spiritual, the, the, the physical space to, to really give yourself time to, to experience this and then integrate it. Um, and I think um, marketing and uh, a lot of money is getting poured into it and a lot of um, uh, attention is being drawn to psychedelics as just do them. They're going to make your life better. Yeah. You know, um, and I, and it's really make sure you have that available because I, from like I mentioned in my, my first I experience, it was beautiful. It was amazing. And Oh my gosh, I was so completely brought into this, this place of connection, but I didn't know how to be a person for a few weeks mm -hmm. because I was like, what is the point of all of this? <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, it's tough when you when you see that that side of things. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's know. a that's a really in depth um, analysis and explanation of set in the set and setting formula. I mean, I've had people say the set doesn't even matter. <laughs> had, okay. Yeah, which is remarkable. And <laughs> so, somebody that I really admired, you know, one of the people I interviewed, she said, "Yeah, set doesn't even matter." It's like my mind does not have to be in the right mindset for me to do this. I will take mushrooms in any mindset and it always has something to teach me. And I was like, well, that is different than what I've heard. Okay. And then you've given me the probably the, the deepest, widest um, definition or explanation of, of mindset that I think I've heard so far. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, that's a really, really good explanation. Oh, thank you. I, I think if, I think if for to, to speak to your your friend, um, whoever that was that you know that mentioned that, um, great on them, wonderful, okay, great. You know, like if that's something that works for you, cool. I have gone into mushroom experiences um, in a recreational way and gotten some pretty stuff that I saw and nothing else, and then yeah. on on like three grams, and then I've gone into a quiet space where I really had a question with a gram and a half and gotten so much more from it. So it's like, what, what's really important to you in your mm -hmm. life? To me, I can't get more time. I, I like, I'm 40. There's no more time available. I had 40 years and then I have however much time I have left. I want to make sure it counts. 
Yeah. <laughs> and if I want to pardon my French, fuck off and, and go waste some, like, you know, six hours of my life and just blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. I have every right to do that. I'm not saying that your friend is always doing that, but um, I want to make sure that my time spent with, with these medicines is, is worth my time. Yeah, no, I totally get it. She has some amazing experiences. Cool. And, uh, yeah. And for her, she actually even wrote a, wrote a book about it. Wow. You know, it, it's, uh, it's Bette Williams, you know, was- I don't know if you've read her book yet. It's a really fantastic book all about her mushroom experiences, but she really surprised me. I was like, so, cause I always ask people in these interviews, I'm like, so tell me what's the key to a good experience, you know, and I hear set and setting and dose and a guide or a, a trip watcher, you know, somebody to be there with you. And when I, she was the only person that I was like, what about set? And she's like, no, set's not important for me. She's like, I'll be in the totally wrong mindset. And I'll be like, I probably shouldn't do this, but I'm like, you know what? That means I need it more than anything. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to go into it and, and, and do it and I'll come out of it and, and get an even better lesson from it. And oh. so it's, it's, yeah, but you know, it sounds like maybe buried underneath there, there is actually a little bit of mindset with a, uh, um, a foundational intention. Yeah. You know, it, I mean, she's not yeah, just I've... grabbing a bag of mushrooms at a festival. You know what I mean? It's still a part of her quote, spiritual existence, you know? Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of people who have had great experiences grabbing a bag of mushrooms at like Burning Man, but you know what the Zendo project came out of the people who grabbed that bag of mushrooms and then did not have a good experience. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, if you don't know the Zendo project, it's, it's, it's a, it was intended to be a safe place at places like Burning Man and other like big festivals mm-hmm. where if you're tripping and you don't know how to get out of it, it's a, it's, it's like sitters to try to calm you down. Yeah. Um, because the last thing you want to do is, is if you have anxiety problems, you know, and then you you give yourself a substance that you don't know anything about, or maybe you do know about it, but it's not the right place for you. And it just causes more anxiety. Why did, I mean, why would you, I mean, maybe you might learn a way in your, in your normal waking life to get out of it, but you may also just stress yourself out. <laughs> For no good yeah, because it is a stimulant. You know what I mean. So it, it is something that could definitely set you on that anxiety curve. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I I I've struggled with anxiety, and I don't really want to create it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Has it uh, Has it helped? I mean, overall, what, what would you say the impact of your psychedelic experiences have had on on the anxiety? Um. You know. Um. Yes for sure. Because I think, um, especially cause I'm just like kind of a general psychonaut. Um, they've given me new ways of looking at things. Mm-hmm. Um, in the past before I did, um, psychedelics, I, I worked with an L- NLP, uh, neuro linguistic programming therapist for a few years. And I got really into that, which is, is basically taking a belief or thought and looking at it from another perspective through kind of like a hypnotic state. That's kind of, if I was going to be able to sum it up, that that's how I would describe it. NLP therapists, I'm sorry. I'm sure you would say something else, but that yeah. was my experience. Um, and I think that psychedelics give me the opportunity to do that um, on my own mm-hmm. uh, often. I, I, I don't really sit with sitters anymore, but that's because I've been doing it for a little while. And I feel like there was a point where I got to where I said, you know what? I think I'm relying on other people too much hmm. and I need to figure out what it's like to do this by myself. I actually sat with ayahuasca the first time alone just recently. And it hmm. was so beautiful because it was just me, just my energy and just my like mind that I, I was grappling with. And I created the space for myself rather than I, I realized that I was reaching for sitters to, do it for me. Okay. Make yeah. my space for me, make it safe. And I, and, and also don't do this. People who are listening just because I said that I did it. It doesn't mean yeah, that you I was going to say, please, <laughs> yeah. unless, you know, you got to be super experienced because so many ceremonies, any, anybody's been in an ayahuasca ceremony has seen and experienced themselves what can happen and to have nobody there to help I, it would require oh somebody who really knows what they're doing and really understands their own experiences and 
So yeah, but I'm glad that you're at a place where you, that really does sound amazing. It, it was, it, it's just part of like where I'm at in my life, in my journey. I realized self-reliance in that space, that context was mm-hmm. what I needed. And, and, and I don't need medicine for that, but it was just an extension of that. It was just an expression of that. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's, again, all these things are, I, I think of psychedelics in the same way that I think of uh, money in the same way that I think of a hammer, they are tools. <laughs> and if you use them well, they're going to, uh, if, if you use them with the right intent, and also just knowing who you are, they're going to let you be more of you and you're going to show more of you. If like, that's, that's what a, a, um, a, uh, uh, a financial advisor told me one time, he said, people, all money does is it magnifies who you are. And so if you have the tendency to be a crappy person, you could be more of a crappy person because you have more tools and resources yeah. to do that. Money and, and cocaine. And, That's what I've heard. Money, <laughs> yeah. And, and honestly, I've been in ceremony, ayahuasca ceremony with uh, somewhat re- mm, reckless people. Mm-hmm. And they, I've witnessed them be more of their reckless selves. Yeah. Give me more. Give me more. Like you, if you, at, at some point, a certain point of an ayahuasca ceremony, if you've already uh, vomited and then you go for another cup, that's reckless in my opinion, because your body is rejecting it. And this, this particular person I'm thinking of that, that was what I, what I saw. And I was like, Oh, this can just let you be more reckless. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Cause I would say most of the ceremonies I've been in people purge and then they keep going back for more and more and more. This particular, I, I, okay, cool. Uh, this I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying, <laughs> And if you, if you listen, if you remember, I'm not questioning you, Kim, um, but if you remember in my stoned ape story, that was kind of my, my big breakthrough with ayahuasca was I was, I, I had purged and I was going back for more oh. and decided not to, and I didn't decide it. There was a guy in line in front of me that was in the fetal position and was taking forever. Right. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I'm just, I'm not even going to do it. Forget it. And as soon as I said that, blam. La Madre came back and, and showed me something really big. So, so what wow. you're saying actually connects with my biggest experience. Wow. I, I, I apologize. It's been a while since I heard your, your one man show. So I don't, I don't remember that part, but yeah, no, it was, it was very interesting, but uh, I was going back for, uh, the, you know, I was calling like a, another baby dose or whatever. I was like, I'm, I'm in such a great headspace. I went outside looking at the stars and I was like, you know what? I don't know if I want to go deep again, but I wouldn't mind extending this. And then again, I just ended up not doing it. So I think that's interesting. I, I think you just taught me something else when it comes to the ayahuasca journey. That's I, I thank you. And I feel like that's what integration is all about having space and, and integration also having like a community of people who've experienced these things to be able to share these things with, cause you get, you get to share and then another person be like, Oh, well, this is what I saw. And then another person could say, Oh, well then have you tried this? And mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's just like in a lot of ways, what I, what um, a ther- therapy group could, could provide, but it's giving you a, a commonality of context of it's in this medicine space. Mm. And let's talk about that you know, but, um, and, and sometimes people come together in a therapeutic space of this is a trauma group. Let's talk about a trauma. And right. it's not to say that's a bad thing. Cause sometimes you need to put voice to it. But I think, um, that a, a lot of people are gravitating towards and for good reason, having these experiences and then going into, um, group sessions and talking about it because it's a, an, an incredible experience that you get to share. And then you get to learn through talking with other people and, and having yeah. those connections. And I mean, what is, I mean, in life, if this year, 2020 has not taught us anything else, it's that we need connection. Yes. By disconnecting through the myriad of ways that we have, the increase of suicide has gone up in such a staggering amount that no one's talking about. It's painful. Um, mm-hmm. 
the addiction is that was really why I wanted to make a space for people with lit mind was addictions about ready to get ridiculous yeah. because everyone's been locked down. Everyone's been stuck in their house and alcohol sales particularly have skyrocketed. And we can't even talk about, you know, black market sales of things because we don't have those statistics, but what we need overall is connection. And, and that's what I think the biggest gift of psychedelics is, is we just get a chance to connect to ourselves again and then connect to other people about connecting to ourselves. <laughs> How great is that? Yes. I love it. I love it. And, and I am, uh, I'm grateful for you coming here and, and connecting with me and connecting with all the listeners and the whole community. Um, yeah. You had so much, so many great things to share. As we close this out, do you have any, any last thing you wanted to get out there? Um, I do want to do a little plug for all the psychedelic societies out there. Um, mm -hmm. I spoke a little bit about them. Um, the um, psychedelic societies, if you've never heard about it and you're curious about psychedelics and you want a place um, to talk to people, not to source them, they are mm -hmm. on purpose, right. <laughs> to talk about the experience and really get some education. Um, there are psychedelic societies all over the world. And the founder, unfortunately, passed away from his own addictions um, mm. uh, back, I, I, I don't remember what year he, he passed away, um, uh, Daniel Jabor. He was a wonderful man who started the, the San Francisco Psychedelic Society. And from there, all of the other societies started. And they're, they're international now. And you can go and find all of them um, and in your area and connect to people who are like-minded, even if it's just the Facebook groups, maybe yeah. they're not really doing a lot in person anymore. But if you're looking for integration groups, they often will have them. Um, great, great resource. Um, and um, thank you so much. Stuart for what you're doing and, and sharing people's stories and, and, and thank you for sharing your own because I, I, I'm, I know that other people will be touched by it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. That's, that's the point we want to, we got to break, got to break the stigma, you know, around things like psychedelics and mental health and suicide, because when we do that, people get the help they need and they're more likely not to die. Exactly. So we got to keep talking. Well, Kim, thank you so much for your time. That was some great information. Um, just truly grateful for you to spend your time with me on this. Yeah, likewise. It was great to, to hear from you and check in. And I can't wait to see what's up next. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. That concludes this edition of the Stoned Ape Reports. Thank you for listening. Please follow us on Instagram at Stoned Ape Comedy. And subscribe to our newsletter at www.stonedapecomedy.com. Again, thanks for listening and catch you next time, Stone Apes.